Let me get that. During the summer months, we're going to be focusing on the topic of renewal. And God is a God of renewal, of second chances. Last week, we looked at the year of Jubilee and what that was supposed to look like in the Old Testament, and how God had, had built it in among his people that every 50 years, there was this great renewal, this great opportunity from renewal. And, and I've heard that the, the word Jubilee actually means to blow the ram's horn. I am not going to blow the ram's horn. <laughs> It would completely ruin the illustration, and it's just better for you to look at it. I tried while nobody was here, and it sounded pathetic. Travis, maybe you can help us out. You are you, uh, I don't know if, if in all of your doctoral studies you had to do ram's horns or not. Three semesters. <laughs> so so maybe, maybe in a subsequent Sunday, Travis can help us with the ram's horn. But we are looking at renewal. We, have a, we serve a God who loves us, who wants to bring second chances, wants to bring renewal to our lives. And I, I'm excited because I feel like the story that we're going to read from the scriptures today, it's one of my favorite stories about renewal, about sort of the reset button and second chances in, in our personal lives. And it is uh, the story of, of Peter and God uh, renewing the call to Peter uh, in that, in the, as it's re- listed in John. So, um, the story begins uh, on a beach, which is a great place for a summer Sunday sermon to begin on a beach. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. This is speaking of Jesus. Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. There was a little bit of backstory. This wasn't the first moment they had met Jesus. They had heard Jesus. Andrew had actually uh, introduced Simon or, or Peter to Jesus. But at this moment of their life, they're doing their daily occupation, being fishermen, mending the nets and, and casting nets into the sea to catch fish. And Jesus says, I want you guys to follow me. This was a tradition in that culture where a rabbi would walk up to people and say, follow me. And it meant that for the next couple of years or months of your life, you would dedicate that time to following the rabbi around and, and whatever they said, you just did. And, and it was a little bit of a different way to teach, I think, than we think of teaching in a Western sense. We say, sit down at a desk, and, and some of you graduates just did this for like four years. You sit down at a desk, and you, and you write things down, and you listen to lectures, and then we have a commencement where we release you into the world to go do all of the stuff you just learned in four years. And, and Jesus' style of teaching was different, and the Old Testament style of teaching was different. It was, hey, let's do something. And then we're going to get back together and talk about what we just did. What did you learn from what you did? What information would have been helpful on the way into doing that? And so they already had the experience often before the lesson was taught. And we tend to to switch that around in, in Western education. And so Jesus is asking them to follow, essentially come and learn from experience. Walk with me, go everywhere I go. Watch what I do and learn from that. And then those of you who know the the Gospels, you know that there were times where then Jesus commissioned them and sent them out for like these short-term trips and they had to go out and come back. So Jesus has called them and it says immediately they left their nets and followed him. They had already had some time to think about this, but they say, yeah, I'm going to do it. I don't know where your call from Jesus happened. Okay, for me, I was probably about six years old in, in a Sunday school class. And I, and I had the background, I mean, because my parents had brought me to church, but there was kind of this moment where the, the teacher was explaining about really what salvation was about and, and how you receive Jesus as your Savior. And I, I feel like I kind of got it, even as a six-year-old. I know that might seem really young, but, uh, you know, I just kind of had the, the Bible foundation. We read the Bible every day in our home from the time that I was a little child up there. And, and, and I just remember like kind of, like God's call, like, hey. And then I think there have been other times throughout my life where, where Jesus sort of taps you on the shoulder and he says, this is what you're supposed to do. And you just try to be yielded and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to do it. I don't know what the, the call of God has looked like. That, that first call is typically the call of salvation, but then sometimes there's a call, a commission to do something. And I know in my own life, 
it's kind of gone like this. There's been times where I feel like I've been pretty obedient to the call of God and the call of, and then there's been other times where I'm just like, I've, I've strayed away from it. Okay. And probably if you've tried to walk with Jesus for a certain number of years, you've probably had that experience where there's times where you felt like I'm doing pretty good, I'm pretty close. And then other times where you're like, man, I feel far away. It says immediately they left their nets and followed him. That was Matthew's account. Let's, let's look at Luke's because Luke kind of expands on that a little bit. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in, this is Luke uh, chapter 5, to hear, uh, the, to hear the word of God. He was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, just another word for Galilee, and he saw two boats by the lake, and there were fishermen had gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon or Peter's, he asked him to put out a little bit from the land, and he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. This gives us just a little bit more background to the story. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. I'll do it. I'm not happy about it, but I'll do it. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking, and they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, isn't that weird? Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. It's like, I'm not worthy to follow you. I'm not even worthy to be around you. Like something is special about you and I don't think there's anything special about me. So I'm a sinful man, O oh Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And also uh, there was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought to their boats the land, they left everything and followed him. And then three amazing years go by as they walk with Jesus. I mean, imagine how many times in those three years, did they see somebody who was blind receive sight? Somebody who couldn't walk and Jesus healed them and they jump up and they start running. Can you imagine the, the joy on somebody's face who's been blind and now they can see or, or, or all of the times where Jesus rebuked evil spirits, cast demons out of people and, and, and healed their mind and their spirit. I mean, there were so many things that these disciples saw for three years. Not to mention walking on the water when Jesus came out to meet him on the boat. Jesus speaking to the winds and the waves and saying, peace be still, and a storm stopping and the water becoming tranquil. And all this time, they're, they're just following Jesus and they're learning from Jesus. They're, they're listening and watching as Jesus interacted with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all of his critics and how they were never able to trip Jesus up. He always had perfect wisdom because he's God in flesh. And no, no person could trip him up. His, question, his answers were always right. And then a lot of times Jesus would ask them questions that they couldn't answer to kind of put them in their place and help them learn. And then just a few days before Jesus goes to the cross, Jesus is describing, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be persecuted. They're going to kill me. And what does Peter say? No, not while I'm around Jesus. Right. You don't have to worry about anything while I'm around. And and like they didn't have concealed carries, but apparently Peter had a sword. OK, I don't know if this, you know, and he's like, no, Jesus, we got this. OK, we're OK. Peter's in the house. You don't have to worry about anybody getting you. By the way, this is an amazing prop sword. <laughs> what does Jesus say to Peter? Peter. It's big talk, but what's going to happen? You're going to deny that you even know me. No, no, no. Yeah. And, and you're going to do it before the rooster even crows twice or when the, before the rooster crows. And 
What happens? They come to arrest Jesus in the garden. Peter whoops out the sword, right? Takes a swing at somebody, misses terribly, just nicks their ear. Peter, and Jesus says, put the sword away, Peter. They lead Jesus off to the trial. Peter follows at a distance, kind of scared to be with Jesus. Now, he was big talk. Now he's a little bit scared, and he's following from a distance. And, and somebody comes up to him and says, hey, weren't you one of his disciples? Now, they could tell by his accent. Like, I'm from West Virginia. I understand being able to tell, like, from y'all, you know? And, and so, like, they could tell by his accent. They're like, no, you're from Galilee. You, you're, there's no reason for you to be here unless you were one of his followers. And he says, I don't even know him. I don't know what you're talking about. Second time, oh, I'm, I'm, we're sure you got to be one. Of, no, I'm not. The third time, he, he swears, he calls an oath down from heaven. I don't even know. And what does he hear? cock a doo do And he's sorrowful of heart. He had great intentions. Let's, let, let's, not, let's not beat Peter up. Man, I've made those kind of commitments like, Jesus, I'll do this. I've, I'm going to read my Bible through this year. I didn't even make it feel like Leviticus sometimes. So, you know, the fact that Peter kind of falls back whenever look, Jesus is going to go through this trial and crucifixion, I think most of us would have taken a step back to. And he's made this big promise and he's fallen through on his promise. And then Jesus is crucified. He's buried. There's a report that he rises from the dead and Peter's the first one there with, with John at the tomb to kind of look and see what's happening. The tomb's empty. And, and then there's these little reports that keep coming and then they see Jesus a time or two. And now we're going to pick up the story in John chapter 20. What's interesting about John's gospel, in John chapter 20, verse 30, it says this, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Now there's too much to write. But these are written, what I have included here, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And it's almost like that's the end of John's gospel. But then John's like, I don't know if there was a little bit of a page left and, and paper was, was expensive back then, or he still had some ink. Or, but he, there's one more story. And then John 21 happens, and he writes this one final story, and that's what I want us to look at this morning. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. Again, another name for Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and the other, uh, two other disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. If you're looking for a good verse in the Bible, it's a good one. Haven't seen that one on a coffee mug yet, but Peter said it, so it's a good phrase. I'm going fishing. Of course, what is he really saying here? Hey, it's been a fun three years, fellas. Didn't quite go the way we intended it to go. I'm going back to work. Where did the story start? He's fixing his nets, and Jesus says, come follow me, and he's left, it. He's left those nets now. And now what's he saying? I'm going back to my job. Going back to the family business. What did they say? We're going with you. And they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they did it. Now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, and that's, that means John. In John's gospel, he never refers to himself by his own name. He always calls himself the disciple Jesus loved. I don't know if that was trying to like, tell the other disciples something or what, but I don't know if it was a humble thing or a proud thing, but he's like, the disciple Jesus loved. Uh, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. 
Start swimming for shore. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from land, about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and he gave it to them and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed after the disciples uh, with, to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So there's a conversation that has needed to happen. And it has been avoided twice. There's been two other opportunities where Peter could have said, hey, remember about the rooster? Sorry. So he's had, have you ever had one of these things happen like you knew you needed to talk to somebody about whatever? And you talk to them like two times, three times, and you just, you couldn't find a way to bring it up? It looks like that's already happened now twice with Peter. He's had a couple chances. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? I think he's pointing to the other disciples because Peter has says, I'll, I'll go with you to the very end. I'll never forsake you. And so he says, do you love me more than everybody else, Peter? What a hard question for Peter to have to answer. And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. My understanding is that the, the Greek on this, there's a little bit of a play on words, the, the type of love that Jesus is saying to you, agape me, and, and Simon is answering, I phileo you, like he's using a different, like a little bit less of a level of love to answer the question. Verse 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Why do you think Peter's grieved? How many times did Peter deny? How many times does Jesus ask? Yeah. See, I mean, Jesus was on trial. Jesus is getting put on the cross. So, so Jesus wasn't there hearing Peter deny, right? So Peter's got, now, now Jesus is kind of letting him know, I know, Peter. I know, and I know it happened three times. Peter was grieved. Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Uh, this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. So Jesus is prophesying to Peter the way in which Peter would die. We know that Peter was also crucified. You will stretch out your hands and people will take you to a place you don't want to go. And after saying this, Jesus says something really interesting. What does he say to Peter? The very thing he said at the beginning, follow me. This whole couple years has happened. Peter's seen it all. Peter's denied and failed miserably. And Jesus reconciles. And what does he do? He comes back and he says, Peter, would, would you like to push the start over button? Would you like some renewal? And Peter's like, yeah. And look at what happens in Peter's life after this. Peter becomes this great cornerstone or, not, or, or this great uh, person who begins preaching in the church. And, and so many people, I mean, he, 
just a few days after this, after Christ goes, uh, ascends to heaven, Peter's going to preach and like 3,000 people at once are going to believe in Jesus. After saying this, he said, follow me. What's the takeaway this morning from this final story in John's gospel? Takeaway number one is that Jesus wants you and me to follow him. The call that he made to the disciples is the same call that Jesus makes to you and me. Follow me. Be a disciple. Lord Jesus, I just want to live the way you want me to live. I want to be obedient to your commands and your teaching. That's why we we talk about the gospel as something we obey. Jesus wants you to follow him. He wants me to follow him. Secondly, Jesus forgives when we mess up when we follow him. Aren't you thankful for that? There's this verse in the Psalms that says, you remember my frame and you know that I'm dust. In other words, God, you made me. You remember my frame. You know I'm dust. I'm going to mess up. And even though we mess up, Jesus still forgives. And when we mess up, Jesus still comes back with the call again. Hey, you struggled to follow me? I get it. You know what I want you to do now? Follow me. Oh, you you tripped up and you struggled to follow me? You know what I want you to do now? Follow me. Jesus renews the call. He forgives and he renews the call. In 1 John, later when John would write another letter to the churches, he said this, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness like it never happened. Jesus doesn't keep coming back to Peter, beating him up for the three times. Peter denied him three times. Jesus gives him the opportunity three times to say, I love you. And then Jesus is like, that's done. Follow me. It's done. Follow me. My question to you this morning is, is Jesus renewing a call to you to follow him? Somewhere, somewhere along the way, maybe at a church camp, maybe in a church service, maybe just through reading the scripture and prayer, you decided, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going for it. Let's go. And you left your nets, so to speak, and you said, I'm going to follow Jesus. But life has thrown you a curveball or two, and you found that following Jesus wasn't easy. It was actually kind of difficult. And maybe you slipped up along the way. Man. Just like with Peter, Jesus is saying to you, hey, it's okay. I already paid for that on the cross. Follow me. And and I want you to hear a renewed call from Jesus this morning to follow him. Perhaps you are hearing the call to discipleship for the first time. Maybe this is kind of a new thing for you. This idea of following Jesus, becoming one of his followers or his disciples. We say here at Leesburg, our our goal is to love God, love our neighbor, and it means that each one of us is trying to read God's word and encourage one another to follow Jesus. And, And if you're not following Jesus and you want to try to follow Jesus, we want to try to help you follow Jesus too. And guess what? Everybody in this room who's following Jesus has messed up. But you know what? We've also heard Jesus say, it's okay, I got that covered, now just follow me again. Maybe you're hearing that call for the first time. Maybe you're at the beach at the beginning of the story. The story begins and ends on a beach. Some of you are on the second beach, and some of you are on the first beach hearing Jesus call you for the first time. Some of you are over here, you followed Jesus and messed up, and you're, saying, you're hearing Jesus say, follow me again. But some of you who maybe you're on that first beach, maybe you're kind of like Peter and you're saying, I don't know if I'm worthy to follow Jesus. Remember, Peter's initial response wasn't, yeah, great. It was depart from me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, I know you're a sinner. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm calling you because you've messed it up. And I came to fix it. So if you're on the first beach this morning, I would encourage you, decide to follow Jesus decide to become one of his disciples. If you're like Peter and you're on the the second beach and you've decided a long time ago, but you've kind of slipped up along the way, this is a great opportunity. This is a summer of renewal, and today is a great opportunity to renew that commitment saying, Jesus, I'm going to follow you again. 
and he welcomes you back. Father, I pray that whichever situation we're in, whether we've never set out to follow you, and today's kind of the, you're, you're, you're touching our hearts to, to start following you and following your example and following your teaching. Or Lord, maybe we've tried to follow you at times and failed. Either way, Lord, I pray that we would experience your forgiveness, your healing, and that we would respond to the call to follow you. You are a good shepherd and you lead us. And I pray that we would hear your voice and follow after you. In Jesus' name, amen.